Roll call, please. President Kardoski? Here. Trustee Service? Here. Trustee Paul? Here. Trustee Zerbel? Here. Trustee Atkinson is excused. Trustee Krieger? Here. And Trustee Fluke? Here. Please stand for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please remember our men and women throughout the world in uniform. Um, I have no changes to the agenda. I need a motion to approve, please. Move to approve. Second. Okay. Motion and a second to approve the agenda as presented. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed. Motion carried. Action on the minutes from the open and closed session from December 12, 2023. Move to approve. Second. Motion and a second to approve both those minutes. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed. Motion carried. Number six, comments from the public must be limited to items not on the agenda. Must state your name and address. You're limited to five minutes. The board's role is to listen and not discuss the item. Personnel issues cannot be discussed nor individuals named. And the board is not able to take action at this meeting. Are there any comments from anybody in the audience on items not on the agenda? Any comments from anybody online or in the audience? Items not on the agenda. Hearing none, we'll move on. Number seven, written communications and or announcements. The one announcement I do have, um, I would just like to say that our finance department, headed by Greg Wenholz, again, got the Government Finance Officers Association for the 2022 um, fiscal year. So they did a good job. Um, they usually do, so just wanted to make sure everybody knew that. Okay. Mary, I'd like to make an announcement. Um, this past Friday, we uh, lost a very solid member of our community. Uh, Ed Kirchmar passed away. Uh, he was a longtime teacher at a Schwabenen High School. Coached football for 41 years, coached baseball for 42 years. Uh, just wanted to make the announcement because um, he was really great. And outstanding for our community. He touched many, many members of the community um, over the years through his teaching and through his coaching. So I just wanted to make everybody aware of that. Funeral is uh, this Friday and this, uh, this Saturday. You can look up obituaries online. Yeah, that was a very sad announcement when I found that out on Monday. Okay, anybody else? A quick one uh, to the... Uh Public Works Department, uh, I get comments from people delivering parcels to our village here and how nice they compliment the people cleaning our roads, making them easy to drive on to any other community that they run in. So uh, uh, kudos to you guys for doing a good job in the storm that we had. Yeah, that was a heck of a storm. Okay, now. Recognition of our newly promoted public safety supervisors. Chief, you're up. Okay, thank you. This evening, uh, we are here to swear in and celebrate the promotion of our newest lieutenant, captain, and commander. Before I do that, I want to thank our village manager, Joel Gregazeski, our village president, Mary Kodoski, and the entire village board for supporting the public safety department. Since I've been here just shy of four years now. Already? <laughs> it's going fast, hasn't it? It certainly is. <laughs> we have added three new swarm positions. We've added an investigator position. We've restructured our uh, supervisor positions and added four new captains. And we've also added a commander position. So without your support, we would not have been able to achieve that. So thank you all very much. We appreciate that. I'd also like to take this opportunity to support, uh, to thank our officers, our POC firefighters. I see we have a couple here today. So thank you. And I know I speak on behalf of myself and the board and the community. Thank you for all you do to serve and protect our community. Appreciate that. Thank you much.
So as we recognize our newest promotions, I would like to say that each of these individuals have demonstrated an unwavering commitment to the department, to our community, and to their profession. Their, their profession. It is my honor to present to you Lieutenant Mitch Deterville. <laughs> Captain Jason Demarath. And Commander Tom Baxter. We'll start with Mitch. Mitch, before he came to us, worked at Fox Crossing PD and started with uh, public safety in 2018. He became a paramedic in 2021 and also a field training officer. In 2022, he was a, cad a cadet advisor and a fire EMS instructor. He recently became the newest member of the Brown County SWAT team and of course promoted to Lieutenant in 2024. Captain Demarath spent nine years with Sauk Prairie PD, two years with the city of De Pere. He gained his paramedic license in 2014 He's our Honor Guard, uh, was an Honor Guard member and as our Honor Guard Supervisor, Crisis Intervention Team Supervisor, an FTO in 2017, and is currently our uh, oversees the program, Mobile Field Force in 2018, promoted to Lieutenant in 2020, and of course Captain in 2024. Commander Bagster. Huge shout out. Welcome. He is a former military vet of the U.S. Coast Guard. Appreciate your service for that. <laughs> I had to emphasize that a little bit because the Coast Guard just doesn't get their due. <laughs> <laughs> highlight that a little bit. Yep. yep. Coast Guard's a great organization, Chief. Mm -hmm. There you go. Uh, he was hired as a PSO paramedic in 2004. Uh, FTO in 2008 for eight years, Brown County Fire Investigation Task Force, SWAT team for Brown County, uh, Mobile Field Force, promoted to lieutenant in 2017, captain in 2020, short stint as interim commander in 2023, and now commander in 2024. So congratulations to all three of you. Now, I've changed things up a little bit. We're going to do a little different oath. So if you would, I'm going to try and break this down for you. Raise your right hand and repeat after me. On my honor, I will never betray my integrity, my character, or the public trust. I will always have the courage to hold myself and others accountable for our actions. I will always maintain the highest ethical standards and uphold the values of my community and the agency I serve. Well done. Congratulations. Now for the exciting part, the badge pinning. So for those who are going to uh, handle this task, come on up. Let's give it a shot. <laughs> All right. It's not a race, but, you know, it's not. No, really, it's not a race. <laughs> Go ahead. Put them on there. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Congratulations, Mitch. Thank you. Jason. Thank you. Thomas. Thanks, sir. 
Welcome to our newest supervisors. So, thank you, much. Congratulations, guys. <laughs> okay. On to the next thing. Number eight, action on the consent agenda. Consider, discuss, act on resolution R1-1-2024, opposing Senate Bill 691. Consider, discuss, act on resolution R1-2-2024 to permit the sale of fermented malt beverages in Ashwaba May Park for the 2024 Ashwaba May food truck rallies and the Ashwaba and Blast. C, consider, discuss, act on hourly pay rates for election inspectors. D, consider, discuss, act on the 2024 ash tree removal bids. E, Parks, Rec, and Forestry Department monthly report. F, Public Works Department monthly report. G, investment report. And H, budgeted expenditures. So every, I would need a motion to approve if everybody. Move to approve. Second. Motion and a second to approve the consent agenda as presented. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed. Motion carried. Thank you. Number nine, public hearing. Public hearing regarding a rezoning request for parcel VA-882-2, 3560 Packerland Drive, from Business Park BP to multifamily residential R3. Is there anybody in the audience or online who would like to speak for or against this rezone? If you'd like to come up and Talk into the mic. State your name and address for the record, please. My name is Julie Christensen, and I live at 3615 Packerland Drive. So basically, um, I'm right across the street from the rezoning possibility, um, Kitted Corner. Um, so it's going to be very close. <laughs> so, um, so we've lived there for 24 years. Um, when we bought our land there, it was it just about the exact same time that the land was annexed over to Ashwaubenon from the town of Lawrence. And so at that time, we were told that it was gonna be zoned rural estate, um, which is great, but there's not a lot of point to that if we're gonna have apartments um, that close to us. Um, basically, I think that all of my neighbors and I have spent a lot of time and effort and you know, making our neighborhood very nice. Um, we have kids that run between the houses and the yards and play and um, I guess it, when you look at apartments being that close and possibly three stories high, uh, you're looking at a lack of privacy. You feel like you could be watched being in your own yard all the time. Um, so it, they just seem like they would be very inappropriate there. Um, number one, the traffic and the noise would be a 24-7, 365 um, challenge, except if it's a business, it's, I mean, we'd love to see that stay green, <laughs> you know, forever, but if there were a business that were to go in there, at least there is at times that it is quiet, it's not constant traffic, and it would be um, with adding these apartments here. Uh, I feel it would also affect the resale values of our homes. Um, being zoned rural estate, um, it's going to be very hard to keep that a selling point if there's apartments right there. That, that just doesn't seem to fit. So we are concerned about our property values going down because of it. So um, just not an appropriate spot for it. There are apartments there close to the company that is there. If I understand correctly, when I talked to, um, I believe it was Aaron from the village, he said that the company that owns it, um, IDS, was looking forward to having the apartments there to help them with their employees I'm um, not sure the, the thought process on that. There are apartments very close to there, but it's tucked back off of the road, so they're very inconspicuous. So they do have apartments as an option. Um, and the rest of us, you know, we're going to be there a long time, hopefully, and uh, we would just love to keep it more rural like it is. Okay. All right? Okay, thank you. 
Is there anybody else, either in the audience or online, that would like to speak for or against this item? Thank you. Could you state your name and address, please, for the record? Jim Rasmussen, 1511 Fernando Drive, DPO. Okay. Thank you, Jim. Okay. Your thoughts? So we've been um, living in the house that it's affected by this development for 42 plus years. And uh, it's been a family neighborhood all the time that we've been there. And uh, the use of of the land adjacent to us, which we're, there were one house, there was one house between our house and where the proposed apartments would be. And the proposed use is not a positive for the value of our property and the use and pleasure of, of our property for raising families and having the quiet and privateness of a of their large real estate lots. And the, the concern, one of the big concerns of this development that's proposed is the impact on our value of our property. And certainly when you own or purchasing real estate, there's different kinds of land usage that if, if it's your neighbor, is a positive or a negative for, for uh, value. And this multifamily is certainly not considered a, a, a positive for the value, value of our house and all the people involved in this. The effect of this Bless development. Bless you. Thank you for the time to express my thoughts. Thank you, Jim. Is there anybody else who would like to speak for or against this project? Please state your name and address for the record, please. Hi, I'm Jim Roach here. I'm a neighbor that's closer to the development than he is. Uh, I don't need to echo all of their concerns. Mine are the same as they have. I do have a, if I did not hear before that they were looking, the company that owns that building, the old Ameriprise building, was looking to build apartments there. There's a very similar size tract on the northeast side of their building than on the south side. It's about two acres less. If they really need to have apartments, there's apartments there already on Main Street. So why would they not use that for instead? the the usage of that for apartments is going to be if that corridor comes through which they're talking about and that's going to be a run there's going to be a bazillion cars coming down Packerland that is on my side of my house so I'm worried about that for traffic already I really don't particularly want to see a whole bunch of more traffic because of apartment buildings in that corner opposite of my house so that's my major concern is the traffic problem there is going to be immense if they build, build apartments there Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, is there anybody else who would like to speak for or against this project? Anybody else who would like to speak for or against this project? Okay, hearing none, I need a motion to close the hearing. So motion to close the hearing. Motion and a second to close the hearing. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed. Motion carried. Okay, number 10, 10A, consider discuss act on a rezoning request for parcel VA-882-2, 3560 Packerland Drive from Business Park BP to multifamily residential R3. Now I just want everybody aware that we did get an email from the person requesting this at about 5.57 tonight. Um, asking us to pull this item from the agenda. We can either postpone it or we can vote on it. It's up to the board what you would like to do. Well, this came in front of the Public Works Department uh, at our 
annual meeting, and we denied it immediately. As far as I'm concerned, I would like to deny the request now. Gary, could you tell me why it was denied, what some of the reasons were? Because the industrial park was designed to be what it is, not at a bunch of, uh, a resi of apartment homes. Uh, they did a very good job on building this, or this uh, section up as what it was designed for. It was not designed to have multifamily housing. We have, we have um, very little business park land left, um, so that was... Part, it was denied at plan commission on a seven to nothing vote. Yeah, and that was one of the reasons I, you know, denied it at that point. It, it's just, it's a valuable parcel, and um, I really appreciate the input as well. Um, I just yeah. think it's it can be better used for something else and not impact them as much as what it would. Plus, it, it needs to align with what the business park was built for so that's that's where my thoughts came from you know we worked hard on that we've had a bunch of uh, proposals for the property that we just sold and a lot of it just didn't fit the the design of that and uh, we finally did find somebody that was that is buying it right now with a very nice piece of a project and we'd like to see like you said we don't have much land left let's let's make good use of it and and stay in accordance with uh what we designed it for. So with saying that, I'll, I'll make the motion to uh, deny the request for the rezoning. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second to deny the request for the rezoning of parcel VA-882-2, 3560 Packerland Drive. Any other discussion? <clears throat> Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, motion carried, thank you. 10B, Consider Discuss Act on Highland Ridge Estates Phase Two Development Agreement between the Village of Ashwaubenon and Highland Ridge Properties, LLC. Aaron. Oh, I'm sorry, this is Patrick, not Aaron. I, Patrick. I guess it, it doesn't necessarily matter. Um, if, the, <laughs> if the board recalls. The spider killer, by the way. <laughs> was. Euro. Uh, if the board recalls, in 2021, there was an approval for the Highland Ridge states uh, to develop, or excuse me, um, for a preliminary preliminary plat to be uh, approved for the Highland Ridge estates um, to, and to go in phases. So phase one was approved with a development agreement uh, to include a schedule of improvements such as uh, um, sanitary, sewer, storm sewer, um, water and road construction guarantees, escrow, uh, things like that. Um, phase one has uh, been pretty successful, and phase two, uh, the staff just um, agreed on a development agreement with the developer, who I believe is here in person. Uh, if there's any questions on that, um, there isn't any concern from the staff uh, regarding this. is pretty straightforward, just kind of updating the plans. Um, they're going into phase two. So it's very similar to phase one, and I think st staff approve and recommend approval on the development agreement. Okay, and more specifics on like the details on that. I know develop this year as well as uh, Brian and Aaron can touch on that as well. Any questions, comments? Okay, I'll, I'll, enter I'll move to approve the Highland Ridge Estates first edition phase two development agreement between the village of Ashwaubenon and Highland Ridge properties. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second to approve the Highland Ridge Estates first edition phase two development agreement. Any more discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried, thank you. 10C, consider discuss act on a Class B beer, Class B liquor license request for Bel Air Cantina, Green Bay Inc, DBA, Bel Air Cantina. Chris. Bel Air Cantina is requesting approval of a Class B beer, Class B liquor license at 1025 Lombardi Avenue, Suite 100. Um, the owner is requesting 120 days under the statement of intent versus the 90 days. Uh, at Public Works and Protection Committee, it was approved unanimously and all the paperwork and fees have been paid. Um, I don't see her in attendance and I don't see her online. She was supposed to attend. Um, Chris, what's the difference between, I mean, obviously the number of days, 120 days versus the 90 day of intent, statement of intent? 
because they weren't going to be ready till then, and she we had one regular license left, and she wanted it. Um, so I said I checked with Patrick and asked him, could she do the 120 versus the 90? Otherwise, she should have to be coming back, and she might anyway, depending on you know how the building process goes, but maybe not. So this would kind of take care of it. Is this development where the turn? Um, um, restaurant is right on the Tidal Town area. Is it a part of that, or I was trying to look at it in the map to figure out exactly where it was. Sorry, Aaron. I can touch on that. Okay. Um, this is in the vacant space in the Tidal Town Tech building uh, on the first floor. Uh, so it's right next to the Associated Bank uh, uh, tenant that's in there right now. Uh, so so again, this is that vacant space right next to it. So west of Associated then, or east? Yes. West. Okay. Yep. This would be that again. There's that one vacant space yet. So you know, whether it's west or east, I guess I'm not entirely sure. But I do know that it is, um, that'd be east of the main entrance to Title Town Tech. Okay, thank you. We had the same discussion at uh, Public Works and Protection. Uh, we didn't see any problem. There was a few questions on a couple of things to the back, but we had no problem in approving that. So if there's no other questions, I'll move to approve. I'll second. second. Okay, we have a motion and a second to approve Class B beer, Class B liquor license for Bel Air Cantina Green Bay with the 120 day instead of the 90 day. Any other questions, comments? Yeah. Um, is this one of the licenses that are um, uh, limited? We only have a certain amount? Yes. Where does that leave us? We're at our limit. We have one reserve left. <clears throat> And then the Title Town District has one left, and we have two that we can get from Hobart, but those are all reserved the 10000 well, not the Title Town, but the others $10,000. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you. 10D, Consider, Discuss, Act on Village of Ashwaubenon Ordinance Number 01-1-24, Amending, Creating Alcohol Licensing Procedure. Patrick. Uh, a while ago, the Village Board asked the staff to create, um, or recommended create some kind of business plan procedure that we somewhat pitched in, a, in an open meeting, and the Board was pretty receptive, receptive to that and then directed us to create a business plan in an ordinance. What this ordinance does in section one, it basically creates that business plan for alcohol applicants or licensing applicants. So um, for the most part, our, our application process is pretty smooth. It comes to the clerk's office, do the background checks and present it to the village board. Um, and we do have some information about the applicant themselves. However, uh, a lot of times staff and obviously the board ask questions as to really what the details are for the, what kind of business they're running. Yes, we're, out, we're licensing um, the alcohol to that person, but what are they running? What kind of restaurant are they running? What kind of activity or entertainment are they going to be having in other hours? Um, what this does, this business plan or this ordinance is going to mandate that applicants will present a business plan to the staff. Staff will create a template, some kind of document, and then give it to the applicants, and they will have a very like, detailed um, questionnaire, so to speak, in describing your kind of business. What kind of food are you going to be having? Where are your, what's your safety plan? What's your site plan? What is your uh, parking situation like? What are your hours of operation? If any entertainment, what, what kind of entertainment? Um, if there's any questions on that, staff can certainly uh, talk to the applicant on that and just making sure everything is transparent, thorough, so that way by the time it gets to the board, the board's going to know really what kind of business is being operated in that establishment. Um, I, we also included a language that if in the future that uh, business changes, right, let's say, okay, we're going to have a restaurant, six months later it turns into a, a, a nightclub, whatever, that is going to, that is against the business plan and that's subject to some, uh, any kind of discipline. So that language is crafted in there. Um, in section two and three of this ordinance, it's pretty much clean up uh, for, to align with state statutes. Section two in the class A, uh, for class A beer establishments, this changes the hours from closing from 10 p.m. to 12 a.m. and then changes the hours from opening from 8 a.m. to 6 a.m. So it extends it by two hours or four hours total when you can sell um, in your class A uh, establishments. 
this is aligned with state statutes. Um, I think this was changed a few years ago or a while back. I'm not necessarily sure why, but uh, this is uh, what is permitted in the state statutes. Now, the municipalities can alter that as what we have on our ordinance right here, um, but the staff felt that just to kind of align and, and, and be uh, similar to other municipalities as well as what's authorized by the state, that this would be uh, an appropriate uh, an amendment. And then section three, uh, kind of small, but this basically says that any um, beer and wine can be sold outside of unsecured areas. So think of maybe like in a, in a Hy-Vee or like you know a quick trip, and maybe you see the the beer and the wine locked after um, they're allowed to sell. So they're they're um, as of right now, let's say a quick trip is selling beer and wine, but they can't sell after 10 p.m. So that has to be locked behind closed doors or in, in a secured premise, secured area. This does kind of change that where it may, they might have some other kind of alcohol just sitting there, not for sale, but the alcohol could be in an area that's unsecured that um, they wouldn't have to put it behind a locked door or something like that. So again, kind of aligning with state statutes. Um, think of like a wine on a rack. It wouldn't necessarily have to be moved or a closed door would have to be uh, in front of it uh, to, to align with the ordinance. So that it basically re removes that requirement. So any questions on that, happy to, to ask them but or to answer. I'll, I'll, add, I'll add a little bit of context to that too. <clears throat> Think about a grocer, <clears throat> excuse me, that has beer or wine on the end cap or oftentimes you'll see wine adjacent to the meat department. And uh, under the current code, they would need to move that, that wine out of that display case that's adjacent to the meat area and put it into their locked intoxicating liquor uh, secure area every day. Uh, with that change, it would limit beer and wine. It would, it, or it would eliminate the requirement that beer and wine be moved and put into those lockable storage areas. Um, if you go through any grocery store, you'll see a, a quite often where they have wine displayed next to cheese or meat areas, beer at end caps, things of that nature. It, it provides some convenience to those retailers from having to move that um, stock every day in order to, to comply with the village's code. Uh, Patrick, on section two, where you list all the different times for when they can be sold, do you think that'd be cleaner just to say follow state statute then if it changes we have to go in and change the ordinance again or doesn't it change that often that that's a concern uh we could i i would anticipate the state statute to change hours of operation um all that frequently uh I, honestly i i'm not really sure why the difference of hours we have regardless um certainly we could have something written where it was just comply with state statute and follow state statute requirements um <clears throat> I think it does help for, I guess, enforcement purposes when there's com alcohol compliance checks um, for staff advising maybe public safety or just the public to know rather than cross-referencing our ordinance with the state statutes to know when the hours are. I think for simplicity purposes, it is nice to have a time in the ordinance, but certainly you could, but I would recommend we keep times in. Leave it in, okay. Um, there's one reason why I like it is when we send out the uh, renewals, we send our municipal code and we also send the Department of Revenue booklet. Our muni code is a lot shorter. Yeah. <laughs> and I think maybe they read that versus state statute. So I, I think maybe that'll help. Okay. You know, sounds good. Okay. <clears throat> um, the problem I have with this is the hours. And I said this back when Green Bay changed their hours, and that was back when I even uh, owned my, um, the business I retired from, um, was I felt, you know, you keep extending the hours. People keep talking out of both sides of their mouths. They wanna, they want to uh, 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 combat drunk driving, but they keep extending later hours to go get beer. And my thought is, is uh, you know, these people, especially, well, I shouldn't categorize people, but, um, um, you know, people are partying, partying on a Friday or Saturday or whatever day of the week, and all of a sudden they got to make a late night beer run. That person 
has been drinking already. So why do we have to go from, we went from 9 to 10, now we're going to go to 12. I wish Chief was here right now. <laughs> um, you know, people adjust. They know what time that, there's, there's states that still don't allow liquor sales on Sundays. Well, people adjust. They know when the heck that they got to buy their stuff. My, my, old, my old business, I'd see people in the middle of the day that come in on their lunch break because they know they had to work till 11 o'clock and they want to have a beer after a shift. People know it. You know, this, just because Green Bay does it, the pier does it, is no reason why we have to do it. I think it all started with a convenient gas, sta slash Absolutely. gas station Absolutely. Uh, on Oneida Street, if I remember this subject way back. And uh, like you said, Green Bay changed it. They thought they were losing business at an event when it would come to town, preferably football. Uh, they were losing out on some of it. That's where it started from. So now, now you know, and I, under, I, I agree with you. We, uh, we're trying to curb alcohol, and what do we do extend the hours? That don't make a lot of sense. Can I just state two things? First of all, public safety did ask because you wanted the chief here, but um, we had some officers come in the clerk's office and, and said it'd be so much easier if the hours were more uniform. Did they? They did. Um, the second thing is, you know, I was in Green Bay for quite a few years, um, but now what's changed is you can go into a bar and you can buy a six pack. Yeah. And you couldn't, you know, up until quite a few years ago. Um, so I think that makes a difference too, that it wouldn't just stop that time, you know, that we had. Now they can just go to a bar. Did they say why that would make it easier for the public safety? With all the different hours um, to keep it straight. You know, I mean, you have your convenience stores, you have your bars, you have you know, your, your um, grocery stores, it's just more consistent for them to know, you know, the times are more consistent. It's more uniform for everybody. Yeah. Okay, that's, okay, that's our job. I'm, I'm just saying that, you know, people are, people talk, uh, community members, politicians talk out of, both sides of their mouths. They want to combat <laughs> drunk driving and then they, they extend the hours. It just, you know, people know when they need to get their supplies. And you're letting people at midnight now, now they're, now they're partying until 11 o'clock, 11.30, quarter to 12. Hey, we need two more cases of beer. Who's going? I, I agree with I agree with everything you said, Chris. Um, and maybe that is something that we need to petition to the state about, because if they can leave, you know, X Y Z house instead of driving to the to the liquor store or the gas station to buy the beer, all they have to do is drive to the next local tavern and they'll buy the beer there. So I think that's why. That, you know what? And I'll and I'll say this: when I was 18, 19, 20 years old. The bars did that anyway. Yeah. They did. That ain't changing anything, that law. The, I don't know about the time. I remember, you know, years ago, there was a time limit on when you could get it in a bar. You couldn't get it, but you did. Well, <laughs> but there was a time limit. So I'm, I, I agree with everything that you've said, but like I said, maybe it's something that at the state level we need to tackle and have them look at those hours. Yeah, and like I said, you know, I, I was in that business, and, and from day one, I said it. I don't want to, I wouldn't want, e even if the state allowed my business at the time to stay open till midnight or 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock, I didn't want it. There's nothing but trouble after that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And maybe they'll find that out. I do want to just add a few couple of points here. So I think the, the conversation that's being had is on, on section two um, in the proposed ordinance, paragraph D, that talks about um, the hours of sale. 
A um, couple quick changes. This paragraph does come closer to aligning with Wisconsin statute as it relates to those closing times, but it does not mirror precisely all of the closing times for a Class A or Class B license. There are specific restrictions or regulations in Ashwaubenon that are different, but it does get closer to that alignment. Um, there's two, two significant changes within the ordinance that, that is being proposed. One is allowing for a Class A license to be permitted to remain open until 12 a.m. on Mondays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. The current code says 10 p.m. Our current code, however, also allows them to be or remain open until 12 a.m. on Friday, Saturdays, and Sundays. So the weekends are already available for sale until midnight. Essentially what's being proposed is just making that consistent throughout the entire week. Instead of having different hours, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, it would remain consistent as with Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So that, that is different from statutes. Statutes do not dictate based on day of the week. That was a re local regulation that Ashwaubenon incorporated. <clears throat> so if the board is in disagreement with making that alteration as part of this amendment, that could be you know, a motion to change the proposed amend amended ordinance to eliminate that 12 a.m. provision Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. The other substantial change is making opening time um, earlier. So right now the code has it at 8 a.m., the amendment would move it to 6 a.m. And that's predominantly to accommodate our local retailers, grocery stores, things of that nature that are open at 6 a.m. So Metro Market, Hy-Vee, Fresh Time, I, I don't, I'm not sure if they're open at 6 a.m. or not, but the major grocers in the area open at 6 a.m. So if you're going to run and do your grocery shopping, if you will, early in the morning, you can grab a wine or a case of beer or something to that effect. And not be impacted by that 8 a.m. start time. So those are, the, those are the two changes that are incorporated into the amendment. So if, if the board is not interested in that portion of the amendment, you can make a simple motion to alter that and then move to amend the ordinance as amended on the floor tonight. So if I understand this right, the state obviously has recommendations or has rules for liquor sale times, but the municipality can limit it more. We couldn't go longer than what the state is saying, but if we wanted to go shorter, we could do that. And we have in the past, some of our ordinance has allowed a shorter time span for selling alcohol. That is correct. So as an example, a Class B license um, can remain open until 2 a.m. and to 6 a.m., we couldn't say you can remain open until 3 a.m. and then open at 5 a.m. You have to be closed during that 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. time frame. Okay. Chris, your wheels are turning. <laughs> I'm going both ways. I, yeah, I forgot that on the weekends we went to 12 o'clock. However, I still, why keep pushing this forward? And the next one's going to be what till two a.m. You know, eventually it's it's got to. People got to. So yeah, you know. under the statute, uh, a Class A license can remain open until midnight, and and it has to be closed between midnight and six a.m. So the proposed amendment that you have virtually mirrors what is allowable under statute. We added previously our existing code has that additional restriction on Mondays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays that you have to close at, at 10 p.m. And then we also added under our current code that you couldn't open until 8 a.m. So we've extended that closing period locally here. The 6 a.m. I don't have a problem with because we got a lot of third shift mm -hmm. mill workers and I get that. You know, the safety department wants it so that it's kind of even across the board. Do they have any other thoughts on this? Meaning, is it 
is it creating a problem or do we have a problem? Well, I think part of it is Chris kind of touched on it a little bit. So you can go to a Class B establishment and still get alcohol after 10 p.m. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday mm -hmm. and get it as a kind of a take takeout, if you will. So it's not restricting the ability for individuals to get alcohol and then leave the premise. It's just a matter of whether you're a, a, a retailer or if you're a bar and what is permittable to be sold at what time of day. The only reason, um, one of the only reasons is, is certain entities want to extend these hours because there are, they're already open, the convenience stores. And um, I know from experience in the past and just talking to people, uh, minors that are getting beer from places uh, that are not supposed to be able to purchase is because they're getting it from their buddies at these locations. And now we're going to extend those hours at those locations. I, th I thought this was more the grocery stores that are open at 6. No, I'm not worried about the 6. It's the... Midnight. Yeah, as, as I mentioned, so it'd be any Class A establishment. So that could be your hy vs your Metro Markets. Uh, it could be your convenience stores. Anything that has a Class A license right. would have that closing time extended till midnight for all days of the week. At present, the weekdays, Monday through Thursday, the closing time begins at 10 p.m. This proposed change would extend that two hours on those four days a week. I think, Chris, the issue in Wisconsin is, you can, if you look at our ordinances, you can get alcohol almost 24 hours a day. There's probably a four hour time span that you cannot purchase alcohol in the state of Wisconsin. And that in itself is not good. It's just too available. I agree with you, totally agree with you. But I think it's a statewide problem and you can get it if you need to. And you know, maybe limiting it here is a good thing, but it's, it's just out there. You can get it anywhere you want. So that's a reason to I know. accept this. Yeah. I agree. I mean, if we can limit it, I don't. I think it'd be great to limit it more. Now, I mean, keep in mind. I, I know there's some um, apprehension to extending it to the 12 a.m. we were hearing, but not necessarily 6 a.m. So the section two of the ordinance can be amended to just allow the 6 a.m. I think that defeats the purpose though of assisting public safety. But I, I get it. That's what the board wants to do. It might create more confusion. Um, extending hours on one end but not the back end but it, with that said I know some of the purpose now there's so much more development in retail grocers or something along those lines it might be more inclined to be beneficial to align with those store hours while still doing some maybe public safety good um, so that section two can be amended if the board so chooses as well to only allow 6 a.m. to keep the 10 p.m. I would maybe suggest that we uh, we don't act on this tonight and let's get more input from public safety on these hours because we're saying, okay, they would like it for to make it more uniform and easier for the officers. I'd like to hear a little more about that, I think, before I act on that because Chris is making some very valid points, and I, I think it's all good. Um, I'm really interested in the part where when they come in to public works, <laughs> that they come in with some sort of business plan so we can understand what they're doing. Because every single one that comes in, we have to hammer through, okay, what are you going to do? When are you going to have entertainment? What nights are you doing this? And it becomes, it, it's, it's a difficult, you know, what food are you serving? When are you, you know, all this stuff. It makes the public works process uh, very clunky and very difficult. I'm all good with these hours things here, I think we need to evaluate that more. I think we need public safety to come in and tell us, yeah, here's the real reason why it's a problem, why it needs to be uniform. I'd like to hear that before we act on that. And, I, and I'm, I'm, I'm not saying I, w I couldn't vote for this. I just wanted to make sure we weren't just shoving this through. Yeah, we, no, and, and I agree, but I agree with you, Chris. I think you make a very valid point um, I'm kind of wondering what's happening at these establishments on uh, when Thursday night football is happening. <laughs> yeah. um, or no. Monday night. Yeah, yeah or Monday night yeah. football. 
As Joel alluded to earlier, the board could make a motion to just approve section one and three of the ordinance for section one, whatever the board's comfortable with, postpone section two, and the village board can bring it back, or excuse me, staff can bring it back at a future uh, committee or board meeting uh, with input with public safety with just that section. I, I, I'll I make, think that sounds good. Yeah, I'll, 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 I'll move a, that. Yeah. Maybe I want to be sensitive to Chris's concerns, but I was also really excited about the business plan option oh God, on that because yes. public, we spend so much time on yeah. that committee asking the <laughs> same questions of every I, applicant. We work, we work too long not to do something about it. Uh, right. You know, I, I can kind of understand being consistent. But I think that's the reason we're up here. Let's make things consistent. Let's make things easier for the, the staff people here. You know, I wouldn't have a problem on approving this, but it sounds like the majority of you thinks we got some issues with the, with the time. Uh, hey, are we the only ones that are gonna be different? <laughs> it's that simple. Yeah. No, I don't, I don't know that there's any, I mean, we could pool other municipalities, but I think it's a local policy decision. I don't, I don't yeah. know that. If I came back to you and said, this is what De Pere is doing, that in earnest, you would really take that under advisement and, and do what De Pere is doing or Green Bay. This is an Ashwaubenon specific issue that, that is based on your values. Um, I, I really would, want to hear what the officers have to say. Yeah, I, you know, I you know we, it would seem like we heard this comment. Okay, they say inconsistent, but what do they mean? How's that creating them a problem since they're officers in Ashwaubenon they should know it's this time and this mm -hmm. time. So what, what, what's, what's their issue? Is it because then when they approach the people, the people are saying, well, wait a minute, I can go get it over here. What, why are you in Ashwaubenon? I don't know. I don't know what the reasoning is. You know, I don't know what they're running into. And I'd like to hear what are the problems that they're running into, and then we can, we can adjust to that. But, yeah, I, I would suggest uh, that that is exactly the issue. Is so when they go out and do their compliance checks, if it is 10... 10 30 p.m. and they visit a ex convenience store in Ashwaubenon, that same operator owns a store in Green Bay, right. or owns a store in De Pere or somewhere in Brown County or somewhere else in Wisconsin. And they say, Oh, I didn't realize that you restrict sales right. at, at 10 o'clock, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, because in such and such community, I can stay open and available till 12 a.m. Um, and so that's really, really the crux of it, is just having that consistency. Um, it's not that our officers are ill-informed or don't have the yeah, ability yeah, to enforce I, was, I, I know you're not suggesting right, that. Right. And they're certainly capable of being flexible and recognizing that even though the statutes uh, may differ than what Village Code has, mm -hmm. it's a matter of convenience to the operator too and knowing that this, right. this is what statute reads. We follow statute. We don't have any additional restriction. So I think from a public safety standpoint, to be quite honest with you, and I'm, I'm going to speak on their behalf, they'll be comfortable either way. They're not uncomfortable with the idea of changing the hours to what's proposed in the ordinance, but I don't think that they will be uncomfortable by maintaining them as they are as well. It's just a matter of how we communicate mm -hmm. it and how we educate and inform the public of what is allowable in Ashwaubenon. Mm -hmm. So are to me, we, at some point, it just, oh, I'm sorry, Mary. I was just going to say, so are we looking to approve section one and three and bring back section two? Yes. That's the motion. All right, let's I make did. that motion. We spent enough time on this. We, we're not in agreement on section two. I'll make a motion to uh, accept Ready? one and three. Yeah. Second. There we go. This thing a done. motion and a second to accept section one and section three and... Uh, Gary, did you want to bring back Section 2? Se section 2 will come back with uh, advice from the uh, public safety. Okay. <coughs> and the second agrees with that also? Yes. Okay. Everybody understand the motion? Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion carried. Thank you. 10E, consider, discuss, act on a recommendation from the Bike and Ped Committee to review Holmgren Way corridor from Cormier Road to Lombardi Avenue. Okay, Joel. thank you, Mary. Uh, this item is coming before you by way of the Bicycle and Pedestrian Committee. Uh, if you recall, a number of months ago, the committee had requested the Village Board support a study to be completed by the Brown County Metropolitan Planning Organization, or MPO. 
Uh, Cole Rungi, who is a member of the Brown County Planning Department staff, had completed his review of that, cor uh, of that corridor of Holmgren Way, again, between Cormier and Lombardi, so not the full length of Holmgren Way. Uh, part of the concept uh, or discussion as it related to that study was uh, the idea of is there opportunities to improve pedestrian or bicycle accommodations within that corridor? Um, Cole had presented his findings to the Bicycle and Pedestrian Committee in June of last year. That packet that is included in your packet for tonight's meeting, along with some other information um, regarding what is commonly referred to as road diets. Um, as part of the recommendation, uh, Cole had presented was the concept of reconfiguring lanes within Holmgren. At present, that corridor is a four-lane undivided roadway uh, with virtually unlimited access onto the corridor from both uh, specific pu public streets as well as private ingress, egress points for businesses along that stretch. After reviewing that information, the Bicycle and Pedestrian Committee also reviewed additional information uh, regarding some concerns that they may have had uh, from the findings in that study by the MPO. One of those items uh, was related to Packer game day traffic and the volume that that presents itself. And so they had the Public Safety Department uh, attend one meeting and provide information as to how they manage game day activities, both pre and post game for vehicular traffic. One of the comments that staff had was also um, not understanding fully what public safety was doing in pre and post game day activity was to establish some type of traffic count method for those high volume dates. Um, however, based on the information we received from public safety, it was identified that that may not be necessary because on Packer game day, in particular post game time, uh, they do route traffic down Holmgren in, on that corridor segment in one-way traffic. So everything moves southbound for a period of uh, a, an hour or two hours or three hours post game time. Uh, in addition to that, the, the committee wanted to review uh, efforts that had been completed this past year by the city of Appleton along College Avenue. Uh, this item did make some local news. If you recall, the city of Appleton was looking to reconfigure College Avenue uh, in its downtown that at present had four lane undivided uh, traffic on it as well. And so there were some comparables, if you will, uh, to that particular stretch. Staff has reached out to the city of Appleton. Uh, one of the requirements as part of their reconfiguration is every six months they have to provide a report to their council as to the successes or failures of that particular project. And they are in the process of completing that first month, that first six month review. So once we have that information, we can certainly share that. Uh, recognizing the efforts that the city of Appleton had done and what maybe other communities have done in these uh, reconfigurations, it was also identified that it would be important to have a conversation, some type of an engagement meeting with stakeholders and businesses along that stretch. Uh, this type of work can be viewed in a very controversial lens. You're taking what is perceived to be four lanes of traffic and reducing it down to two through lanes of traffic. And without adequate engagement and information, um, it, it could be problematic for those businesses because they think that they're going to lose volume uh, as a result of that configuration. So that ultimately would be that next logical step is to have that engagement meeting. Staff had advised the Bike and Ped Committee though before we begin to do that effort because that in itself uh, if, if, you, if you know how things kind of transpire, when you open up that meeting and have that conversation, it can be viewed as uh, in a very negative light. And we wanted to make sure that the village board was supportive of the effort. And if it is, then, then we will certainly hold that engagement meeting. But ultimately, if the board is not genuinely considering making an effort to reconfigure that stretch of corridor, we would advise the board to, to not move forward with it because having that meeting um, could create some challenges for the, for the village 
uh, in relation to its relationship with the businesses on that stretch. So if we had the meeting, we would have to do it very carefully to ensure that they understand that this is still uh, very much a study and we are reviewing options and uh, not give way to the idea that this is a, a done deal, if you will. So the committee had recommended to the, to the village board to hold that engagement meeting and staff is ultimately seeking direction from the board to do so. If the board is in agreement, you certainly can make a motion to, to authorize and direct staff to hold that public engagement meeting with area businesses and stakeholders. If the board does not have interest in reconfiguring that stretch of Holmgren, our recommendation would be to deny the request so that we can ultimately move forward with, with that directive. So with that, I'll answer any questions you have. Obviously, Tracy's on the committee. I see that there, there may be at least one or two members of the committee present as well. What's the proposed configuration that the committee wants Holmgren to be? I don't know that the committee has formally stated uh, a, a configuration. However, one of the options that was presented in the study by the MPO was to essentially take uh, from Cormier to Lombardi and move the four lanes of traffic down to two through lanes with a center turn lane. So oftentimes that's called a modified three lane. So you have two full, lane, full lanes of traffic with a center turn lane that can be shared in either north or southbound traffic. So if you think about those, they're commonly called twiddle lanes, if you will, mm -hmm. where they have that bi-directional arrow in the center of them. Be similar to that. Uh, in addition to that, you would see a marked or, or um, uh, designated bike lane in addition. So by condensing four lanes down to three, that gives you a wide shoulder and it gives you the opportunity to mark a bicycle lane. Yeah, I would agree with Joel. The Bicycle and Pedestrian Committee has not come forth with a desire or a design at all. They've just been really researching, collecting information, having different presentation and really digesting all the information that we have gotten. Um, the committee feels, and at some point I'd like to open the floor to see if any of the, the other two members would like to speak, but um, the committee feels that we're at the point now where we've done our homework and gotten the information that we would like to present, um, and it's time to get it out to the people that live in that corridor, the businesses that are located in that corridor, and get some input from them. And you know, we present the information that um, Director Runge has put together for the committee and for the village, um, and present that and answer questions. Um, this is not a unique process. The committee has looked at um, different road configurations throughout the nation and also throughout Wisconsin. And it's a viable op option for increased safety for bicyclists, pedestrians, and motor vehicle drivers. And that's why we would like to see it move forward and, and get the information out, educate the people along the corridor, as well as our staff and the village board, and, and make a really good informed decision by getting the data and the research that's out there for the corridor. Before this goes any further, um, I've, I went down to Appleton and I, I went through that corridor. It's a totally different corridor than what we've got. Um, and so I talked with Brian Rickert and it, because it is different, Brian, guesstimate, I'm not gonna hold you to any of these numbers, but this is not a, gee, we're gonna change some striping on the road. Am I correct? Yeah, so the striping itself is, is one aspect. Of course, there'll need to be some signage that will go into it. Um, I think the biggest cost uh, with the project itself will be at every intersection um, that, essentially, that essentially crosses, um, you know, Holmgren that has a signalized intersection. The reason for that is, is there is traffic loops, um, and that determines, kind of tells the intersection how to work. So it gives the intersection input as to hey, you know, there's someone in, you know, lane one, lane two, or the left turn lane, you know, that's looking for a green light. So those are things that are going to have to be reconfigured um, in order to allow for the traffic signals to work appropriately. Um, so that means, you know, you'd have to saw new loops or put in um, video detection 
uh, at the intersections to alert the intersection whether there's a car, bike, or pedestrian uh, looking to cross the roadway. Est estimated cost, Brian. I'm not going to hold you to it. Is it ten dollars? Is it no. ten million? You know, pavement marking. I would say you probably have between fifty and a hundred thousand traffic signals. You're over two hundred. I would say two to three hundred um, thousand. So you're talking. If I had a ballpark, it between three hundred, around three hundred ish thousand. Okay. I think it's hard to go to the landowners unless you have a proposal of what you're suggesting. I don't I, I think it'd be really cumbersome to go say, would you be interested in any kind of change to this, you know, to down to two lanes or whatever. I think you should say, you know, would you be interested in this thing that can be modified, but well, and I think the proposal that we would look at bringing forth and maybe Joel could attest to, or um, comment on this as well would be the one done by um, deputy or the Cole Rungi at Brown County that we had commissioned for them to do. He's an experienced planner. He's done a lot of work in this. In fact, I don't know how many of you know, but um, one Broadway, Broadway was four lanes. Mm -hmm. And when Ted Pamperin was a village president, there are a lot of concerns on Broadway. The residents on the north end, there was a lot of noise, there was a lot of truck traffic, it was dirty. It, it was not a pleasant place to live. and. We hired a firm to um, work on that, and Kolrungi was very instrumental in helping design that corridor into the three-lane configuration it is right now. And the residents, specifically on that north end, their quality of life went up with that three-lane configuration, and they also put money into their homes. I mean, you look at that corridor now and how those homes look, it's like night and day. So. You know, Cole has been involved in a corridor study in our community before. He has the knowledge and the expertise. Um, and I just think we need to take steps forward. I mean, I know it's, it's a cost, but what cost is it for the safety of our residents, the safety of our visitors? And a three-lane configuration is almost 30% safer for our motor vehicle drivers, as well as safer for our pedestrians and our bicyclists. So I think it's something we need to at least move forward on. I mean, we're not tying into it saying, yeah, we're going to, and, you know, Brian's giving cost estimates, which is great, but we really don't know exactly what the cost will be and where that cost would come. So I think we need to step forward and just see and talk to the people out there. That corridor is, especially on the north end, along Holmgren, is totally different than it was when it was built. The density for the residents in there is night and day the businesses that are there night and day. And, you know, we're gonna, everyone talks about the draft coming, the draft's coming in 2025. There are gonna be lots of people walking in that corridor. We wanna make it as safe as we can for them. We don't want them trying to cross four lanes of traffic. Um, so I just think it's something we need to step forward on and really see for the safety of residents and for our visitors and to make it a really appealing place to be. Tracy, I don't disagree with anything you're saying. Um, but to compare Broadway to, to uh, Holmgren, Broadway, I think, was... Um, Broadway was 41 at one time. It's Broad the only way you could exit through here. Broad, Broad, the, 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 the situation with Broadway was, was to try to s slow traffic down and get rid of the trucks coming Bro through yep, and things right, like yep, that. Right. Holmgren Way is different. You know, that's tr just trying to be as... Fit. That was put in there to... Tr take the pressure off of Oneida Street. Yeah. And now we're just, we want to make it as efficient as possible. And, and some of these studies here, I always, I always have to question numbers. Um, you know, you look at the, the, the pedestrian um, incidents that have happened. They've happened in non-crosswalk areas. No, you know, you can't nice. legislate stupid. <laughs> or drunk. That's right. Um, yeah, and I agree with you, Chris. That's what pops out at me. I, I struggle with what problem are we trying to solve. And, 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 and I'll go to the bike part, too. Um, I understand there's more bicyclists out there, and, and we want to keep them as safe as possible. And I, and I, and I, and I applaud all those people that are, that are, that are using uh, 
bikes as transportation or just recreation or, or uh, for uh, physical at activity. But nobody ever talks about, it's like motorcycles, nobody ever talks about who was to blame for, for a particular incident. It's always, you know, you look at the stats, it always looks like it's, it's on the motorist. No, I drive around this village all the time and I see this people on bikes or motorcycles that have no clue what they're doing and they're the issue. You know, um, when is somebody going to actually spend some money to educate those people? I agree. You want to yep. spend money. You got to educate the bicyclists. We got to educate the motorists as well. So, you know, there's motorists doing stupid stuff too, just like bicyclists are. I totally agree. I think on a whole, motorists kind of know the, well, I, I'll, I'll leave it. So. <laughs> I had a couple more questions. One is like, if you have the bike lanes on the outside, is there no parking then? There's no parking now. Yeah, that's, that is correct. There's so, no designated bike lanes would restrict parking. Um, regardless, even if you went to a modified three lane, um, you would have to have a trade off either park, like a designated parking lane or the bike lane. You would not be able to fit both to accommodate the amount of turning traffic and turning movements that are on that stretch of road. Okay. My other question is if that center lane is the turn lane. And the only problem I see in that stretch is there's like a hundred driveways. For businesses, it's different than Appleton has the the businesses right up on the street, and you park kind of behind on college. Here, I'm just thinking you're going to have to. I mean, there's spaces there where driveway. It's like driveway, driveway. If somebody's coming from the north and wants to go to Barb School of Dance, and I'm coming from the south and I want to go, you know what I mean? It's like we're going to be like. I could see that being a little dicey. Well, it's no different than that's way down the south end of Oneida Street right now. Except, Except there's, that there's four lanes and then the twiddle in the middle. But um, yeah, it's one of the things with a four lane roadway is when someone's turning left from the inside lane, they're stopping traffic in that lane. And there's a lot of back, end, you know, people either trying to scoot around quick to the right, so you have crashes that way, or people hitting the person in front of them. So what a twiddle does is get that motor vehicle out of the travel lane. And is safer and and starts keeps flowing allows the traffic to keep flowing, um, so it actually is a safer safer design than a four lane um, configuration. Hmm. But if I look at numbers here, we've had six pedestrian incidents, and they were in a stretch stretch on Holmgren Way, where the bars are, which tells me that. Instead of reconfiguring lanes, if you would put in some pedestrian crosswalks with actual uh, lights and things like that to, oh, uh, but I 100% agree with Chris, you can't, they're still going to be stupid. That seems to be more of, of something that would be answering the problem than put, putting in bike lanes. Bike lanes isn't going to fix this. You're still going to have these people getting hit. Well, and the thing I, with... I, so I, I, I'm questioning, what is it that we're trying to solve? Are we trying to solve that we want to get bicycle traffic into that area? Is that what we're trying to do? Or are we trying to protect the people from incidents that are happening? Trying to do both. And a three-lane configuration can do that. If you think of yourself as a pedestrian and you're crossing four lanes of traffic with no median in the middle, how difficult that is? Because you have to watch four lanes of traffic to get across that intersect or that that highway or roadway. If you have a three lane configuration, you have one lane of traffic coming from each direction. It's safer for pedestrians to cross a three lane road than it is for a four lane road because you're not out in the traffic lane as long. Uh, up on Ridge Road, we have five lanes of traffic that people have been successfully. Where in Ridge Road? On Ridge Road, right at Titletown. They're crossing five lanes of traffic up there, and they're going to be crossing four lanes of traffic on Holmgren also with those blinky systems. So I, I would think before we... I've talked to several of the businesses in this area, and they are they are not enthused about this. Do they know... Have they? Do they understand it, Mary? Have we gotten the information out to them? 
And that's why I think the public hearings are important to get the information out to the businesses and the residents up there. Because I've talked to several business owners up there and they would like to see this. So we got both sides and it depends on the information I think that's provided and what they understand and what they don't. I mean, I think sometimes like Joel said, you know, people that are, have businesses are like, if there's not four lanes, my customers can't get here. It's gonna, you know, I don't want it less lanes because people can't get here. And it has not shown to be true. Uh, in fact, it improves, increases business when you slow vehicles down and you have more access for people moving by other forms of transportation. Well, I, I won't disagree that, you know, slowing traffic down is a good thing in certain areas, but that road was built, like Chris said, to take the pressure off Oneida Street. So now you're gonna take the cars off of Holmgren. They're not gonna go back on Oneida. There's, there's not gonna be, this is an entertainment area and this is what some of these businesses have said to me is that we have large numbers of people that are coming here and they're gonna be slowed down, they're gonna quit coming. So anyway. That's you know, and that's room. what they told me. Just so a uh, road dieter um, accommodates up to 25,000 vehicles a day. They recommend that and say that it can accommodate without slowdowns, without problems. Holmgren Way has 5,000, average of 5,000 ADT a day. So it's not above that 25. It's way, way below. College Avenue, I can't remember what their numbers are. Maybe they're fourteen, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 at College Avenue, 1000 a day at College Avenue, and, and it's working down there. So... It's not something that would not work. It's a change. It is a change. Tracy, when you say they, who's they? Studies, all the research and studies that have been done throughout the nation and throughout even the state of Wisconsin, they've but done. But do they factor in that we're one of 32 cities that have a yeah. Yeah. football stadium right, right in the neighborhood? It, right, but. And, and actually, not even, even narrow it down even more. You know, uh, most stadiums are out. So, you know, to say but, they is well, kind it's, of really broad. It's, what, 10 days a year that the Packer games are going, and we already have a solution for that. We're moving traffic out of the Packer, when the Packer game day, down Holmgren, in an efficient manner. Right. By getting them out, going only southbound. And going to a road diet does not change that at all. You can still head everybody out. There's still as much room. They can cruise down, and it doesn't change anything. So the impact of Packer game day is already, if we've talked about it, we've talked about it with public safety. It doesn't make a difference. It still can effectively get the vehicles out of there because of the way they handle it now, and then they could continue to handle it. You know, you can make studies go any way you want sometimes. If you, you're, you're so prone to wanting, or I should say, if you want something so bad, you can turn it and make it sound so good. It's nothing like, an, it's the same thing as an accountant. You wanna show a profit or a loss, I can make the numbers show you anything you want. Now, Holgram was built to move traffic through here. This behind us right here was all woods at one time in the 80s and early 90s. They built Holgram Way to go all the way through to move traffic. What are you gonna do down here in my area or semis or jackknife in the road trying to back into all these businesses that have road cuts or driveway cuts. Throughout this whole area, you have semis trying to get in and out of these driveways. It is not like a, an example we have down in the valley. Everything comes from the backside. This all comes from the front side. So you can't tell me what you want here is gonna be that much safer and that much uh, better for the uh, cyclist. The cost is something we should look at, and it's going to cost money. And if it don't work, we got to change it back. So don't tell me we should do something like Appleton is. They put paint in a row, that's all they did. We got to change a whole lot of other things in order to make this thing work. Uh, I, along with Mary, Talk with the business people here. I had one guy in my office this afternoon. You gotta be kidding me. That's the only answer I got out of him, and he walked out. 
You know, uh, just something that is not right for Holgram Way. I don't care what you say. It's to move traffic. You want to talk about 10 events? You have, and I never got an answer. I want to know how many events are held in the village of Ashwabanon. I'm counting all the concerts. We got a big one tonight, right now. Tonight one's going on. You have so many events coming into this village that it's unreal on what we got here as far as how do we move the traffic. This would it, not impact it. I, I don't talking right now. I'm sorry, Gary. We, we've built this road to move this traffic. Absolutely. And we brought things into this village to help this along, meaning the entertainment. Look at, look at our convention center we built. We got the biggest convention center in this side of, in the Midwest. We got it because we know how to move traffic and we know how to take care of it. I just don't see this thing working. It's um, I would make a motion to open the floor. Second. We have a motion and a second to open the floor. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Oh, aye. aye. Opposed? <clears throat> Gary's a no. Floor is open if, please state your name and address for the record, Kyle. Kyle Jigot, 1480 Cormier Road. Uh, I'm also a member of the Bike and Ped Committee, and the debate that the board is having is similar to the debate that our committee have, had when we, when we first talked about this. So the reason we went in the direction we did is the board needs input, because this is a big change, but maybe not as big as we think it is, or maybe it's, it's bigger, and I guess we don't know. So our hope was not to present this to the board tonight and have the board make a decision. Our hope was the board would say, maybe it's good, maybe it's not, let's investigate a little bit further and let's try to get some facts and try to find out whether this is right for the village or not. You know, we're not sure. And, you know, I, it seems to, it seems, from my point, my point of view, that some of the board members have already made their minds, and you know I'm not necessarily here to change their minds, but I'm here just to say, well, let's look into this. Let's find out if the, if it's possible that this would work. The reason we talked about Appleton is Appleton made a big change, and we're going to find out if it works in Appleton. If it doesn't work in Appleton, it's not going to work here, and we shouldn't do it. Maybe the situation in Appleton is going to be better. Mm -hmm. We don't know. So, so I guess what I'm asking is, let's not make a decision tonight. Let's just investigate and see whether this is something that we might want to do. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Scott. Move to close the board floor. Second. We have a motion and a second to close the floor. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed. All right, I'm going to call the uh, question uh, and make a decision on this right now. There is no motion on the floor. I, I think what I, would, what I would suggest is I would just like to see this, this whole thing at this point tabled until we uh, get the information back from Appleton. No. no. There's no reason. I mean, I don't think there's going to be any information in there that's going to change my mind. Um, but I see no reason why we just don't table it and just wait. I, I would agree with you, Jay, except for the fact that Appleton is totally different. I don't than disagree. Yeah, it's totally different. Right. Every business in Appleton on College Avenue, they're all up to the sidewalk. There are not driveway cuts six and seven to a block. Yeah, I and agree. so to me, that's comparing apples and bananas. And it, it's not the same. So that's my concern. And like I said, I have talked with these business owners. Um, I just said to one of them last week, he, w he heard about this. And uh, he said, my God, when we have an event, he said, we have, you know, 2,500 people. And he said, we have almost 40 events, more than 40 events a year. And he said, that's just greatly going to be, you know, very disruptive for the people coming here, and it, it's going to, you know, change up the traffic. So, um, I, I don't think Appleton is anywhere near what Holmgren is. I, I can't disagree with you, Mary. 
I, I also would say that uh, since this is a sports and entertainment district, which is what it was set up for, and it was basically set up for those type of events, um, you don't have bicycle traffic coming in there for those type of things just because of the time of day and that, that's happening. Could you have some? Maybe. Uh, but experience tells me that no, it's mostly going to be vehicle traffic. One of the things to remember with our sports and entertainment district, and we talked about this when we talked about the hotel on Oneida Street, um, one of the things in our plan is that it's more bicycle and pedestrian friendly. That's one of the things in our plan. So well, just I'm, keep that in mind as we move forward. And I, Jay, I appreciate you waiting for the Appleton um, information, but um, making it a three lane is making it more bicycle and pedestrian friendly and safer for all users and all visitors to the area. Do we have a motion on the floor? I can, I can, Don't. I can say it's bicycle, maybe <clears throat> more bicycle friendly, but I am, I am going to respectfully disagree about pedestrian friendly. I think we've done a lot already to make it pedestrian friendly, but like where are these incidents, I mean, I'm looking at data and where it's telling me, that's not because there was four lanes of traffic there. Yes. Those incidents, there's no way. All no. right, I'm gonna make a motion to deny this request. Do we have a second? I'll second it to move it along. We have a motion and a second to deny the request. Anybody have comments, concerns? Okay, everybody understands the motion. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. So the only one is Tracy? Yeah, just me, yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you. 10F, consider discuss act on a recommendation from the Bike and Ped Committee to install bicycle lanes on South Point Road from Cormier Road to State Highway 172. Thank you, Madam President. This one as well coming <clears throat> by recommendation from the Bicycle and Pedestrian Committee. Um, they are requesting the village install uh, dedicated bike lanes on South Point Road. Um, this would be in addition to a dedicated parking lane on both sides, both north and southbound traffic. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with this area, South Point Road uh, extends from State Highway 172. Uh, it eventually goes into the city of Green Bay at Cormier Road. So from Cormier South uh, to 172 is in the village. From Cormier North, South Point Road extends into the city of Green Bay. This request was provided uh, as a result of the addition of that quick trip convenience store that located on the intersection of State Highway 172 and South Point Road. In addition to that, uh, the city of Green Bay currently has dedicated bicycle lanes on South Point Road that terminate at the municipal uh, boundaries. So they have a dedicated parking lane and bicycle lanes on their section of roadway that, that terminate at the Ashwaubenon city uh, border. <clears throat> this item um, was not incorporated in the, into our uh, traffic control budget for 2024, uh, so there is an expense to do the initial striping. Public Works has estimated those costs between $8,500 and $10,000. Uh, so if the board would like to move forward with the recommendation from committee, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> we would need to allocate the funding uh, to support that expenditure as it was not incorporated in, in the budget. Uh, so you can certainly do that in 2024, recognizing that we would need to uh, use some unexpended fund balance from maybe a prior fiscal year or uh, direct staff to incorporate this project into the 2025 budget for completion next year, whichever you prefer, uh, if, if it's agreeable to, to do that. Uh, in your packet is uh, some imagery that identifies the stretch of roadway that would be would be included in this layout as, long, as well as kind of a profile picture of the lanes being uh, indicated in the section of the city of Green Bay, as well as a letter of support from a resident at 1680 Cormier Road uh, requesting those bike lanes. Again, this came before Bicycle and Pedestrian Committee with the recommendation for, for completion. 
You know, I went down there the other day. What do, what do we, we've got lamers there. We got the uh, weather station there. And we just added the quick trip. That's all that's there. Why are we putting bike lanes there? Where are they going to go when they get to uh, 172? I'm not aware of uh, anything there. Is there bike lanes there on 172? Uh, there is not bike lanes, but on that section of 172, right. it is not a restricted uh, highway, so it is allowable to bicycle on that section of roadway. Um, they would need to bike on 172 to then connect to another another uh, intersection. They'd have to go up to Packerland to find something to go. Right. I don't know. I, at this point, if this was developed more, yeah, I could understand it. But uh, at this point, I do not see any need to have bike lanes there. I drove out there too. There's a lot of neighborhood uh, around it, like all yeah, those, I, all those I, neighborhoods. Yeah, I understand that. And the impression I got when I was driving down it was uh, I was kind of embarrassed a little bit because I thought here it's all nice as long as you're in Green Bay and then you get to Ashwaubenon on and it looks not as nice. So I, I'm in favor of doing it. I don't know that it has to be this year. Maybe next year we could budget for it and do it. But just to be a consistent roadway and not make our our municipality look bad. I would be in favor of doing well, it. Well, you know, you can go over to Packerland and do and do it safely. Much more safer than this. Well, it's more yeah. to bring a corridor to Quick Trip. Yeah. Which I know I know kids, including my grandkids, are going that direction. <laughs> so um, I do I I do see that this this could be done, but we didn't budget for it this year. So my thought would be is that we uh, just push it into next year. I'd like to see it done, but let's let's actually budget for it so that we can compare it with everything else. Yeah, I mean, I just was contacted by Christine Willicott, who lives on the west end of um, Cormier, and her desire to be able to bicycle over there. And she's kind of a new bicyclist, so she's not as comfortable on the road as, let's say, Kyle and I are. Um, so for her, having the striped bike lanes makes her feel much more comfortable. And Quick Trip is a destination for someone in the neighborhoods, either to the north or to the west, to be able, it's close, you run over there to grab something for dinner or whatever. So I think people would, would do it, and you already have the bike lanes on the north end, going into Green Bay that take you up to West Point and kind of can take you right out of town. Um, so it is, I think it is a great connection um, and it would be a nice asset to that road to encourage people to bike and, and feel comfortable to bike on that road. So my question, is this on for both sides of the road? Bike lanes are both sides, yes. Both sides? Yeah, there would be dedicated parking on both sides as well as a, um, a striped and marked signed bike lane on both sides. Yeah, it would look identical to Green Bay, the north Okay, end. so then to get to Quick, if somebody comes down Cormier and then goes down Packer, um, South Point, they will have to cross a 50-foot road to get into Quick Trip, correct? So if a if bicyclist they go south is, from Cormier, if yes. If a bicyclist is heading southbound on South Point Road, utilizing the bike lane, uh, they would have to utilize the road as any cyclist would lawfully. So they would they would use the bike lane, and then as they approach their turn, they would need to enter that lane of traffic, appropriately use right. the correct signals, and then make that turning movement. Yeah. As they would without the bike lane, they would still need to do right. the same. Right. Yeah. Okay. I, I make a motion Jay. to um, go ahead. Sorry. sorry. Go ahead, Chris. Um, that. I've got no problem with that, you know, extending it. It makes sense, extending it from Green Bay to, to 172. And who knows what happens in the future as things develop, although I don't know what else is going to develop around there. But um, but let's budget for it next year. Okay. Somebody want to make a motion? Make a motion. We put bike lanes on and parking lanes on South Point Road from Cormier down to... 172 and put it in the next year's budget. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second to bike and parking lanes on South Point Road from Cormier to State Highway 172 and put it in the 2025 budget. Everybody understand? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. One no. 
Maybe we can get Quick Trip to sponsor it. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Seems good that's, idea. That's not a bad idea. <laughs> 10G, consider, discuss, act on a position, position description for heavy equipment operator. Joel. Okay, thank you, Madam President. This item is being requested by the Public Works Department nice. and was reviewed and recommended for approval at the last Finance and Personnel Committee meeting. Uh, the request is to create a new position of a heavy equipment operator. Uh, it should be noted that this request does not include the hiring of an additional staff member, but rather creates an opportunity for advancement of an existing individual within the department that is currently performing as a field operator too. Um, this newly created position is responsible for more skilled maintenance work. Uh, within Village Streets facilities and infrastructure, utilizing a variety of types of heavy equipment um, from skid loaders, graders, dozers, ex excavators, backhoes. Uh, generally speaking, if you think about our public works field operator one or two position, those are relatively considered semi-skilled. Um, they do operate heavy equipment uh, in a limited capacity. Uh, but this particular individual is, is predominantly charged or tasked with operating um, those heavier pieces of equipment that do require a higher degree of skill and experience. Um, so with that, when an individual is um, moved into that particular position, uh, they are able to potentially advance between grades. So at present, the field operator two position is within pay grade number five within the matrix. Moving it to a heavy equipment operator, that position would score out at a grade six. If this were to be filled with a new employee, so not that, that is not the case today, but if it were, the base wage differential between those two positions is about 90 cents, 97 cents per hour or $2,000 per year. When we hire, or I shouldn't say when we hire, when we advance a, an employee into a newly created position, they advance to that next grade, however, they only move to the step that next corresponds to their current rate of pay. So that 97 cents per hour is not indicative of our current situation. That would be only if it were vacated and we were hiring a new employee into that role, which is not the case. Um, so again, the job description is included in your packet. This item was presented to finance and personnel and was recommended for approval. So Joel, this is strictly a pay grade deal, is what you're saying. Well, do, does the person have to do any schooling or anything in order to advance to that, to apply to advance to that, I should say? The, the current incumbent does not need to do anything in additional to what they already have obtained. But if the position were vacated and we were to hire that position outright, there would be an experience requirement and a skill set that would be required as part of that position. Is there a grade six right now? Y yes. Yep. There are people, other positions, maybe not necessarily in public works, but based on how other positions score out, they may fall within that grade six. So the other, the other element that this does is it does provide an opportunity for an employee that's presently performing as a field operator too that may, let's say, have maxed out into their current grade at grade five would give them maybe one to two additional steps by advancing into that next pay grade. Well, and Brian, what I'm guessing, this gives you a little more flexibility, correct? Yeah, it does. So ultimately, you know, we... We have a staff member that um, performs additional responsibilities above and beyond what our yeah. field operator two um, currently does. Yeah. So very familiar with sign placement throughout the village, you know, operating around fiber optic lines, stuff like that when yeah. we're doing um, that type of work. So also calls on all the diggers hotline yeah. locates and stuff like that. Um, that's not a responsibility of our, our current field operators. Do they help with those activities? They do. Um, but they don't necessarily, you know, coordinate and, you know, perform those higher risk, higher responsibility excavations um, like this individual does. I like, uh, I like being able to do that. So, yeah, I'll make a motion to approve the position description for the heavy equipment operator. Second. Motion and a second to approve the position for description for heavy equipment operator. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. No. Aye. aye. 
opposed? Motion carried. Thank you. 10-H, consider discuss act on Fragmites control and landscape installation services request for proposal for area surrounding 1499 Lombardi Avenue. Rex. Well we're, well, we're just getting all kinds of interesting discussion topics tonight. This is basically getting rid of all that lovely Fragmites in front of Cabela's and uh, along 41 uh, on the backside of Argonne Park to Morris. I have John Waiter. John's one of the principals with Stantec um, in terms of, of making up the plan. He has come up with a landscape plan which has been vetted by staff uh, as well as Park Board, um, as well as a five-year management plan because as everyone probably knows, Fragmites just doesn't go away when you first treat it. It, it needs continual work for a number of years to get it to be manageable. So John has come up with a five-year plan. He's here to help answer any questions anybody has. Um, there is funding for it through, through, through TID. Um, and I guess I will just open it up uh, and see what the board thinks. How bad do we want to get rid of it? Have we, we started something there already, Rex, if I'm... <laughs> Correct. We did. We did. John John's firm went in and did an initial spraying. Right. This we had to do it to get the ball rolling. What we had to do it this fall. Um, so what would happen if this is approved this evening? This plan is then John would make up bid specifications because this is a large enough project where it probably would need to be bid out. And so then multiple firms would probably come back and. And, and submit a, a, a cost quote on that five-year management plan. So this is just to move forward on this? To continue moving forward, yes, sir. Move to approve. Second. A motion um, and a second to approve the Fragmites Control and Landscape Installation request for proposal. Under okay. discussion, um, I would ask that we require their agreement to have a written agreement with the Packers for future uh, maintenance cost and allowing us to be on the property before we go ahead with this, just to make sure it's not our property, a lot of it, and I just think it's important to have that. Well, if the, if the board is agreeable to, to the motion that Gary is making, um, one of the uh, recommended motions that we had provided in our packet that uh, essentially we would approve the specifications that were included, which Gary has in, identified in his motion, but to also direct staff to advertise and solicit those proposals and then draft any agreements, easements, or permits necessary to perform the work. Right. Ultimately, we have to come back to the board to approve any of the agreements, contracts, or services. So we would package that all up in one, uh, one effort, if you will, and that would come back to the board once we have those prices, proposals, agreements. Okay. Right. So you're okay with that, Gary? Yep, letter roll. Okay, and Kelly was the second, or were you the second, Chris? I was. Okay. Now, John, John has been sitting here this whole meeting, and someone asked him a question. <laughs> I got I got it. So we sprayed it once. What was that supposed to, or what is that supposed to accomplish? State your name and address, please, John, for the record. Uh, John Waiter, 157 Edmond Drive, Green Bay, Wisconsin, 54302. So what was the question again? <laughs> but we sprayed it once. What was, what was that supposed to accomplish, or what is that accomplishing? So this, the spring that was done in October or early, late September was a dormant season spring, so that was to kill the existing Phragmites that's there, that's growing, the 10-foot the tall stuff. Okay. It doesn't do anything for any new sprouting that takes place in the spring. Okay, because just I go by there all the time, and I just don't notice any, like when you spray a dandelion, you see it shrivel up and die. The plant was already going dormant when we sprayed it, so okay. it takes the chemical into the root system much better. Okay. Um, you'll notice a difference this spring during resprout. There'll be okay. a lot, much all the all the tall stuff will eventually fall down, or be mowed when we implement the plan, uh, um, and then you'll just have the new growth stuff, the, the shorter stuff. Okay. I was going to add add to that, Chris. Are you going to cut that this spring? That is the plan in the in the five year plan. Yes. To, it's to, to mow or mulch okay. in the spring. Yes. yes. Uh, John, one of the questions that came up at Park Board, too, was the concern with the Phragmites that are on the north side of Lombardi, and if they're going to be blown in there, or if you've talked to Green Bay at all to see if they're going to do any treatment there. We have not engaged Green Bay at all, um, but I believe that that is still, isn't that DOT roadway right away on that side, too? 
So I don't, I'm not sure the logistics as far as having to coordinate with Green Bay or if it would be a coordination with DOT only. <laughs> but yes, there's always, the, I mean, there's Phragmites everywhere. So yeah. there's going to be um, seeds and whatnot blowing in from everywhere. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's a risk. But the maintenance plan, you know, details treating it for five years, there's going to be treatment that's going to be required beyond five years as well, but much less cost and effort. Yeah. Um, there are several grant uh, grants available from the state of Wisconsin for Phragmites treatment and maintenance. Um, it's tough to gauge how much money is available because we don't have other than just some preliminary conceptual plans right now as far as what the treatment would look like, but you actually have to apply for those grants in order to know what kind of money you could get. Um, there is also a grant that Bass Pro Shops slash Cabela's Corporation has for um, restoration invasive species treatments. Um, we've called them, and there's just a simple online application. We don't know the dollar value that that grant would be um, for either. Is that something, John, that you would contact Green Bay about, um, letting them know that there's a uh, possible grant money available? Yes, that we could contact them, yes. There's also grant money for actually restoring um, a degraded wetland like that, you know, putting in native species, trees, shrubs, vegetation like that. There's also grant money available for that work as well. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so we have a motion and a second to approve the Phragmites Control and Landscape Installation Services request for proposal spe specifications and to direct staff to advertise and solicit proposals and draft any agreements, easements, or permits necessary to perform the work as specified. Any other comments? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried, thank you. 10 I. consider discuss act on a proposed Argonne Park area trail and boardwalk route. <clears throat> Rex. Yep, this is the boardwalk trail and route on the back side of Argonne Park. Um, if you take a look on the map, uh, on the park itself, that is proposed to be crusher dust, which can be dug out by staff. In fact, we've got a couple spots that we'd love to take some of that dirt and move it to and and then just put the crusher dust in there. And once it hits the woods, that's the that's the expense part of it, per se. The rest can be done at minimal cost by with village labor. But the boardwalk, obviously, is going to be the expense. Um, it's going to be, it, it would be a similar boardwalk if we, uh, and we would bid this out again. If, you, if this is approved tonight, it would be bid out and then come back to the village board for, for final approval on whatever the cost may be. But it's the boardwalk through the woods. Now, the woods is, is all wetland. I would probably say the majority of the woods, 90% of it, uh, mm -hmm. is filled with dead ash. So there would have to be some ash coming down uh, to, to, to prep the way and, and to make it safe for the boardwalk route. Um, and I would probably, I would be working with Stantec, with John, on, on maybe one or two alternates. You see how there's two, two exits from the woods out onto Argonne. We'd probably pick one as the main route and, and have the other as an alternate. We'd like to see two, but we don't know what the final cost is going to be. But uh, this would, um, this would, uh, by approving tonight, we'd, we'd get the bid process rolling on this. One of the reasons why this is coming to the village board tonight is this boardwalk portion is on Green Bay Packer property. The woods is, the park is village property, the woods is Green Bay Packer property. So because it's on someone else's property, we are getting, going through the, pro we would go through the process, get the, um, the easement, I guess, or the okay from the Packers on paper in writing. Um, to, to put the boardwalk in. And because of that, that's why well, you're seeing it tonight. This was approved at the park board last week to, to be forwarded to you guys. I, I know people that actually walk, they walk down the Argonne Trail to get to Sherwood yep. to walk through the, the woods over there. So I'm sure that this would be heavily used. So, okay. Oh. I think this ties in great with the whole... Um, previous discussion we had about the Phragmites, um, because that, even that area on uh, Lombardi is getting more walked, more people walking and biking on that area, I notice all the time, and just coming around that corner, and if we, we open that up, we're, it's more visible to everybody. I think that the, these two projects both are, are just, um, they're interconnected, and um, 
and it's just going to be a really nice look for that whole area. And like you said, Mary, and it goes right yeah. in the Sherwood Forest. And it's a good walking route, biking yeah. route. Yeah. Okay. Anybody like to make a motion? I'll make a motion to approve the proposed trail and boardwalk route in Argonne Park and surrounding property and to direct staff to draft development agreements, assessment, easements, and design for the construction of a, a board for construction for board consideration. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second for everything that Chris or uh, Jay said. <laughs> Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed. Motion carried. Thank you. Thank you. 10J, consider discuss act on Waterford Park playground equipment replacement proposal. <clears throat> well, this is one of the fun, more fun parts of the job is when you get to work with different playground manufacturers and design playgrounds. So what happened was we worked with the six major manufacturers. We had them each design um, uh, a playground. Uh, based off of what s some of the unique features were in their catalogs. Uh, we put those six designs up on our website. We sent out uh, roughly 500 letters to uh, neighboring homes around the Waterford Park area, so fairly good sampling. I want to say we received 139 responses back, which is about a 23-24% response rate, which we were happy with. Um, the number one... Um, vote getter uh and let me say this staff liked all of the design so whatever one is picked we we're good with because we were happy with all of them but the number one vote getter uh was uh play world um equipment which is to the far left uh directly underneath the map on the wall um, and with that being the number one vote getter staff is recommending that is approved for the waterford park installation this summer um, we have worked with Playworld before. The equipment at Sandacres Park is Playworld. The equipment at Mike Van Park is Playworld. And the new rope climber at Pioneer is also Playworld. So they're, they're, we, we have no issues with the equipment nor the company. When we get it up, Rex, I will take my granddaughter there and she will give her stamp of approval if she likes it. Hopefully, we we have awesome hopefully it parts. will be her new favorite park. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, we approved this at um, Park Board, and um, like I said then, let's give the people what they want. Um, so I'll make a motion to authorize the purchase of Playworld equipment from Midwest Playscapes in amount of $119,977 for the Waterford Playground Equipment Replacement Project. A second. Okay, we have a motion and a second to... Purchase the play, play World equipment from Midwest, Midwest Playscapes in the amount of 119977 for Waterford Park. Any further discussion? And under discussion, um, I mentioned this at Park Board, but I just want to uh, mention to the um, Village Board as well. But I'd like to commend Rex on how he handles this process. I think it's really important to get the input of the neighbors and the users for a lot of reason. It's their equipment, and they're going to play on it. But I think it also um, commits some ownership of that playground, and when they're out there playing on it, they may take a little more pride in it, and if someone's doing something they shouldn't be or vandalizing it, they may step up and say something. So I like your process, Rex, and I commend you on, on how you handle it. Thank you, Tracy. I agree. Okay. We voted on that, right? No. Oh, okay, we have a motion and a second, though. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed. Motion carried. Thank, Thank you. you. Number 11, you. items for next agenda. There you have anything. Call the office. Number 12, closed session items. During the meeting, the Village Board of the Village of Ashwabnan may convene into closed session pursuant to item 12A on the sheet. The Village Board may thereafter reconvene in open session pursuant to Wisconsin Statute Section 19.85, Parent 2, to report the results of the closed session and consider the balance of the agenda. Need a motion to go into closed session? Moved. Second. Motion and a second to go into closed session. Roll call, please. President Kurgoski. Yes. Gary Paul. Yes. For, uh, Trustee Zerbel. Yes. Trustee Service. Yes. Trustee Krieger. Yes. And Trustee Kluke. Yes. This conference is no longer being recorded. Thank you. Thanks, John, for waiting so